Okay. Your limiting factor. Well, welcome to today's uh, program. Jo thanks for joining us on oh, this well, uh, rather autumnal late June <laughs> afternoon. Um, this is the final program of our Science on Screen program, which uh, has been going on all year. Uh, we were able to do that through the support of a grant from the Coolidge Corner Theater and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Science on Screen is a program that um, aims to increase uh, or to raise scientific literacy by pairing uh, films, whether they be blockbuster, documentaries, um, classics, with leaders uh, from the fields of science and technology and medicine. Um, so obviously today's uh, presentation relates to the two films that uh, we've screened at the cinema over the weekend, uh, Soylent Green and At the Fork. Um, and our speaker today is Tim Cruz, who is, among other things, director of research at the, the Land Institute here in Salina. And Tim, uh, I saw he has some notes, so he must have his <coughs> thoughts organized, but I would imagine that at some point um, he'll want to open things up to a, a, a nice discussion. So with that, uh, Tim Cruz. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bill, and uh, thank you for participating in the science on, on the screen, if that, that's what it was, uh, on screen. Um, it's, it's great. It's, it's something that uh, is typical of the Salina Arts Center to integrate uh, community conversations and, and go outside of a narrow definition of art and, uh, and see how it connects to the rest of the world. And certainly these two films uh, caused us to have a lot of conversations, Sarah and me. Um, and I hope that you all are ready to have a conversation because I'm certainly not going to just sit up here and talk. Um, being the invited uh, discussion leader, however, I, I will take the opportunity to make a, a couple of opening comments. <clears throat> I'm curious how many people had seen Soiling Green back in what, 73, is that, okay. And then um, how many, yeah, right, right, that's about what I saw too. Um, and, and how many did see At the Fork? Quite a few, okay. Um, well, it was, Soylent Green was better than I expected it to be actually after all this time. I was, after seeing Twister on a previous uh, event that was, well, um, maybe not quite as intriguing as, as Soylent Green was in terms of a, a thought experiment and just a dystopian portrayal of, of kind of seemingly where, we, where we're headed in the distant year of 2022, which just also was remarkable to see that and know that when we first saw that date, uh, it was, well, the movie was kind of feasible. Uh, right, and in fact, the movie followed Paul Ehrlich's publication of the Population Bomb by just a few years, and that book, coupled with a, a handful of other kind of Malthusian-inspired projections of where society was headed, um, definitely portrayed a, a, a super overshoot in terms of population, as the movie portrayed. And um, the, uh, the scarcity of all sorts of critical minerals and fossil fuels and things like this. I'm sure that everyone else was, you know, kind of taken back at the at, at mentioning global at climate change in the movie also as being really central to why they didn't have food. Um, it was too hot to grow, and, and the conditions were were no longer viable to produce abundant amounts of food, and so they're having to resort to these, you know, mass-produced chips. Um, and, you know, for those of us tracking even back then the ch climate change discussion, there was global cooling around that time also as one viable hypothesis that was, you know, put out there, and, and global warming was definitely uh, a, a not mainstream at that time, but uh, nevertheless, it was fully integrated into the movie, um, so that, that was intriguing. 
I guess I would just like to suggest that the movie is still not that far fetched. <laughs> and and, and it, when, when Paul Ehrlich is interviewed about how outlandish some of the claims or um, speculations they made in the population bomb were, he also will come back and say, well, you know, obviously we had some things didn't turn out the way we've predicted, but the, the basic overshoot of society in terms of uh, living within what, what Johan Rockström, who is an a, a ecosystem ecologist in Sweden, calls the safe operating zone for humanity. And this, is a, this, this was first launched in a paper in 2009 in Nature, and it's been revised since then. But in the world of ecology, Rockström has framed um, a, a bunch of different areas in terms of us living in the ecosphere, this term that Wes Jackson is pr promoting a lot and, and goes beyond just biology, but rather thinking about ourselves in, on a planet that is an ecosphere. And, and what I mean by that and what Rockstrom in safe operating spaces means is that we're, about, we're overshooting the planet's capacity to regenerate the very basic life-providing things we depend on, like water and clean air and food and, and a, a safe temperature and things like this. So on the list of safe operating spaces in this in Rockstrom's papers is climate change. So that's one area where we have already overshot and we need to get back. Rate of biodiversity loss. The nitrogen cycle, something I'm very interested in and involved in. We're all involved in it, but I, I pay attention more than most. Uh, and how we've overshot the nitrogen cycle in terms of the planet's ability to function coherently as it has over evolutionary time. The phosphorus cycle, something even fewer people think about, but also we all depend on. Stratospheric ozone depletion, ocean acidification, global freshwater use, change in land use, the conversion of natural ecosystems to cropland, atmospheric aerosol loading, and finally chemical pollution is the list of, of areas that this group in Sweden is trying to keep track of individually to assess where humanity stands in the ability of the planet to maintain viable systems to, for us to live in. Not to mention every other species, right? So Soylent Green to me was a, a kind of a, well, it was just, you know, well, Charleston has to, I mean, there were, there were some crazy things about it, but, but the, the portrayal of, of too many people living at a very substandard existence um, does not seem to be outside of the realm of possibility at all in the next 50 years, 10, 50, 100 years, who knows when. But based on what we know to be the planet's ability to sustain life, we are living in borrowed time, particularly with respect to our dependence on fossil fuels, which I'm happy to talk about because fossil fuels makes it all possible in agriculture and so many other aspects of our lives. So those are just a couple of comments about uh, Soylent Green. Um, I wonder if we want to structure the discussion to focus a little bit on Soylent Green. There are some, I, I have actually tried to connect the two a little bit. Uh, and I'd be curious if anyone else saw some relationships between the two movies. Not obvious, but intriguing. Um, but why, why don't we open it up a little bit just to, to comment on Soylent Green and thoughts, impressions? Specifically on Soylent Green. Yeah, yeah, for the moment. And then we'll move into the, the next film in a second. If there are any. I was talking to Bill about that movie yesterday, and we both agree, you know, I mean, as, as an artist and, and an art administrator, it looked like it was made in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just really crappy production. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, I felt a murmur of disgust when Charlton Heston's name was mentioned. 
I'm on that side too. Uh, but yeah, I'm with you, Kim. I just, just perfectly reasonable. Hmm. I mean, so logical conclusion. Yeah. Uh, and you know, there's certain things that really bother me, and it, it, it must be the imperial upbringing, because. Stephen Hawking the other day, I read where he said, we've got to find another planet. He's been saying this for a while. Earth has become too small for us. Wait a minute. <laughs> Isn't that kind of a reversal of reality? I mean, mm -hmm. it's a big ball. And we've just become too big for it. Our bridge is so to speak, right? Well, you know, I've been thinking we're the only species that I know of that has overpopulation. Globally. Yeah. I mean, there's other mm -hmm. you know, star rings mm -hmm. over here, fire ants over there, but, but globally, it's us. Yeah. I wanted to say, coming back to the movie specifically about that, cinematically, yes, but you write the production, you could be your backyard. But Speak up. Uh, the, con Speak up. the contrast between that bleak, washed out atmosphere throughout the, throughout the movie. And then the wonderful little like pictures of roses and sunsets and so forth. And the last really is, a, is that contrast because that's what they're offering up is this paradise, 20 minutes of paradise. I guess it was 76 virgins or 70, whatever, 72, whatever. But, uh, that, but that's what you, that's what they live for is that last 20 minutes of this beautiful earth that once was. Well, you know, you can go to the Lower East Side, New York, who, who in this room wants to live like that? Yeah. I don't know what they call a tree. Is. Yeah. Well, for that matter, those cattle in the, uh, <laughs> in the livestock uh, feedlots, whose life is not worth living, as Lisa says. Yeah. There's a, I hate to monopolize this, but there's one of those reality shows that I just loathe, I loathe most of them. My brother turned me on to this one called Fat Guys in the Woods. Does anybody <laughs> We're not in a rarefied atmosphere. I, I, I recommend it. <laughs> and and, and a, a former student and friend, Sherry Nichols, is in Kentucky or someplace like that. She said, oh, I love that series. Well, it's this, it's this outdoorsman who knows what the hell he's doing. He'd take these three fat guys out to the woods. <laughs> They live together for a day or two, they build a shelter, and after they're, they're given a liter of water, at the end of which time, they've got to find their own water, they've got to build their own shelter, and they've got to find their own food. Well, this one episode, they discover a, an animal trail, and there's something big on it, and it's down in a, in a deep ravine, they keep checking back, and there's a wild boar. Well, those are mean guys, and so they, this guy led them to build certain things, and three of them crawled down in this thing to corner this boar. They caught him, and the leader gave the guy a knife, <laughs> a huge knife. They told him where to stab him, and he did, and the guy lost a heat cry. He'd never, he'd never done anything like that. And the leader said, look, this, you've all had ham, you've all enjoyed bacon, this pig lived a better life and died a more dignified death than what you've been eating. And that's real power. Mm -hmm. Other comments? The link, the link has been made between the two movies already. Yes. <laughs> yes, they have. Well, we that must. <laughs> yeah. I guess when I was watching the film, I was able to watch uh, the Soil and Green actually on Amazon Prime. Um, you know, I, I looked at the date, as you said, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, it was released in 73 and population of Ireland in 68 and the limits of growth in 72. Right. But Club of Rome, and, and I said to myself, well, 
what's happened since then, you know, what can you easily access? So I I did all Earl Earl thing and I and I, I came across a, a, a what they called a retro report in in the New York Times online in 2015 and was titled The Unrealized Horrors of the Population Explosion. And the Times doesn't do all the time, but in this case they did a, a video interviewing uh, food food security experts and what struck me as interesting is a lot of reference back to uh, these predictions and uh, they had ex one, one of the experts was from India and they, she was describing how um, how Erla got this idea uh, because he was, a, he was a butterfly ecologist and he was in India uh, sometime I guess in the, in the early 60s mm -hmm. um, and he'd never been in an environment with dense populations and it just struck him. Uh, uh, he wasn't a population ecologist, you know, I guess at that point in his career, his academic career, it just struck him that if what he saw in India uh, was extended to the whole world, it, it would be like soil, soil, soil and green, I guess. Right. And, um, and so what, what she pointed out was that, was that India did you know, some awful things that got into into into, into uh, mandatory sterilization, and they did a lot of awful things. But um, uh, she said, in the end, it was the green it was the green re revolution that that transformed India from being this basket case to being, <coughs> I guess, a red basket. Um, and so that it, it just struck me that first of all, it was an interesting article to view, and then. Plus to read a little, you know, the, you know, the supporting information, but um, it just struck me that the uh, uh, that this all these re reassessments, you know, when when will they end? When will we get to a point where we say that you know our tra our trajectory uh, is not ten years, fifty years, or hundred years? It may be a thousand years, ten thousand years. Yep. Know, and, and also gets back to this idea about science communication. Uh, you know that uh, uh, people who uh, were uh, uh, seeing an alarms and who talk about catastrophe, and then it doesn't happen. Right. You lose cred cred credibility. How do you communicate that idea that you know? Yeah, there may be a, a, a likely event that uh, we're, we're going to be in dire, dire straits. Um, but how do you make the case the fact that it's uh, it, it's just a it's just a it's just a probability? It's, it's one scenario that that um, uh, may not pan out, and so therefore uh, uh, not to be uh, locked into in a, you know this 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 forecast uh, that that causes people to not trust you. Yeah. So yeah. Well, that's, so, that's so Jerry, I want to say I appreciate you doing that research. And it's interesting, the Green Revolution, of course, is based on fossil fuels, on nitrogen fertilizers, and so on. So that did postpone the inevitable. But rather than being a bridge to the future, it also was an ever longer plank off the pirate ship that we're being walked to. Because that abrupt end is still out there. But we don't know we're on that plank because we still have fossil fuels, we're still expending that, and they're still contributing to our eventual demise. So what you say is true. We extend the out into the future. We don't know when that's going to hit, but the effect of it will be much more catastrophic when it finally does. That's, that's one, one th th theory. Uh, I think the Green Revolution, as much as it was based on fossil fuels and energy, it was based on, ge on, on, on genetics. Well, let, let's pull those together because it, it, it was both and, and it required both to, to work. The, I mean, the genetics were to re redefine the architecture of wheat in particular with respect to India um, and, you know, make the, what they call the harvest index, this, this part that you harvest, much larger on the, on the plant, which is something we're trying to do with perennial species right now at the Land Institute. Um, but when you have a much larger seed production on a plant, seed contains a lot of protein 
which though is made of amino acids that contain a lot of nitrogen. And all of a sudden, in order to support that increased productivity of the Green Revolution, it became essential to use copious amounts of synthetic nitrogen, which is the most energy expensive input into modern agriculture. Okay, I mean, it blew up the Oklahoma City Federal Building. You know, people have been uh, pulled off airplanes because of ammonium nitrate on their shoes. Uh, it it's, it's, has a lot of embodied energy, and all that embodied energy came from typically uh, natural gas. In China, they use coal. But it is one of our most profound links in terms of our <coughs> food to fossil fuels. We don't eat fossil fuels directly, but uh, Vaclav Smil, the Canadian geographer, has said that about 40%, I think more like 50 now, because he said this in 1990, 50% of humanity owes its existence to nitrogen fertilizer. He claims it's the most significant existential invention of humanity in the 20th century. Um, and, and by that he means more people would not exist if, they had, if we hadn't invented synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. So as we push 9.8 billion people by 2050, which is what the uh, report last week that came out suggested, you know, it's arguable that about four, and four to five billion of them may owe their existence to nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, well, that's part of what, what trash Malthus theory. Well, yeah, exactly. It, it, pesticides, you know, right. it, it did grow more than arithmetic. And I think this is the, the point, although we're, we are hitting a limit, uh, again, uh, we haven't had and can't foresee anything like the Green Revolution happening. Um, now there's, there's some pretty out there ideas in terms of raising food synthetically entirely, growing meat on uh, tissue <coughs> cultures. That, that we should say, well, we might as well just move right into the next film, I suspect. Uh, we're, we're on the way. I, I do want to say, uh, tie this conversation of nitrogen with the, with the uh, at the Fork film, because um, I found it to be a fantastic <laughs> portrayal of, of some of the complexity around, you know, the omnivore's dilemma, as Michael Pollan calls it. Um, what should we be eating? At what price? And yet, it, the, the, the movie was predominantly in the uh, animal, um, kind of humane treatment of animals realm, which is perfectly fine, but it, it, did, it did not delve, for example, into the broader ecosystem impacts of raising meat um, so much. Uh, the, the whole problem of confining animals to this space means you have to ship tons of grain to where those 12,000 12, to 80,000 pig farm uh, populations are, and then the manure is concentrated there beyond belief in a way that you never ever have concentrations of nutrients like that occurring in a natural ecosystem. And then, it, but, but to transport those nutrients back to Illinois, where maybe some of the grain shipments came from, or to Kansas, or wherever they came from, um, is prohibitively expensive. And so you end up having uh, very problematic concentrations of nutrients in the regions where you raise animals, confinement animal operations, everything from Chesapeake Bay to the Arkansas River Valley in Oklahoma. I mean, it, it is a huge problem. And the degree to which humanity is verging on growing more of its meat this way creates just catastrophic water quality issues not to mention greenhouse gases that come off methane and nitrous oxide come off feedlot landscapes because again there's just too much nitrogen there um, so it's it's another reason why having animals out on a perennial pasture eating and pooping in a in a ratio that makes perfectly good sense for that ecosystem is, uh, is just, well, is as important. It's just another layer of, of, of rationale as to why that system of confinement animal husbandry is, is extremely problematic. Um, 
I, I, Tim, I think also that probably capitalism is is one of the culprits also. I mean, you, you know, my, my father-in-law was a, sort of a farmer. He had cattle and he loved them, you know, and he respected them. And uh, uh, I found it real sad when the farmers started believing the bullshit of more production and you've got to do this, you've got to do that. <coughs> and, uh, and I haven't finished watching the film, but there, you know, there's farmers around that know how to make it uh, uh, without that stuff. And because they're paying attention to what nature has done. And, and you know, it's, it's just, it's, well, I'm reading about some of the Antarctic uh, explorator, explorers, and they had the same attitude that we can overcome anything. Scott proved them wrong. You know, you can't. Uh, and, but we still have that, and that's why I think it's kind of an imperialist attitude get from the Brits. And uh, the, the only society that makes sense to me is, is the primitive societies, you know, and, and they're the ones that want to keep the oil in the ground today. We're just following the wrong leaders. <laughs> yeah. I have some couple of questions, not being a scientist and probably totally naive and this regard. <clears throat> Two things. I just feel an immense pressure on agriculture because of our unreasonable demands for food and what we want to have on our tables. And I don't think on the bucolic farm with one cow per acre or whatever can't meet the demand with that also, the CAFO operations, uh, they do a kind of artificial uh, feeding, it seems to me, in order to boost weight and growth by a tremendous factor in a very short period of time so they can get these animals to market. So <clears throat> at some point, we've got to have more public education than we have now about diet. I mean, we're all, this is the choir here, you know. We, right. we, don't, we don't need that. My other question is, is there some empirical study that relates availability of good pasture to the numbers of animals we can feed on it if we want it to spread things out in a, in a way that isn't so harmful to land and I don't know the answer to that. There are certainly places where we don't have a lot of rolling pasture land like we have here. And I'm thinking globally, not just in the American West. Yeah. <clears throat> well, the, I guess, yeah, did you? I was just going to say we can eat less meat, right? Like, if people ate less meat, you wouldn't have to produce as much. Food. Yeah, there, I mean, there's a... Here's a paper uh, by John Foley, who's now at the California Academy of Sciences, and he, but the, the author list is a lot of the heavy hitters, including the guy I just mentioned, Rockstrom. Um, Solutions for a Cultivated Planet, and it offers five suggestions for what humanity must do to have enough food and to leave enough nature available for other species if we're gonna have any hope, is, is what the, the thesis of this is. And the, the five simple points that they make um, are that we need to um, stop expanding the footprint of agriculture into other less productive, because we're already farming the most productive lands, so anything we expand into is lower productivity, more marginal lands, and it's where the rest of nature is living. Uh, and so, stop the footprint expansion of agriculture, increase the food produced per hectare or per area of land, um, but without inputs, without more purchased inputs. 
So it's, you're, and, and we call this ecological intensification as opposed to input intensification, which is what the Green Revolution was about, pesticides, fertilizers. The, the, the proposal here is to have an agriculture that actually does a lot more of what needs to be done because of the plants and the microbes and everything that are involved to make a very productive ecosystem. More productive even than, than we're doing with the inputs is, is, their, is what they're promoting. And then, they, and then the others are reducing uh, meat consumption and there's absolute universal agreement that that has to happen. At least with the folks who are eating 200% of their protein requirements in meat. Uh, we could easily bring it down to 40% from animal products, have plenty of animal in our diet if you like that. And if we did that in the US, <clears throat> some of us have, have worked on some statistics that would show we would not need nitrogen fertilizers in the US. You could take land out of grain production, put it into legumes, have a rotation and produce all of the food in the US without synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, even though we use more of it per capita than any other country in the world right now. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting relationship with meat and, and animal products. Um, and the fifth thing, which Barb was talking about after the movie, is uh, reducing food waste. Uh, we, the, the, the number that people talk about a lot, at least in, in the U.S., is that we throw out 40% of our food. You know, so for every one plate of food we eat, we throw out four-fifths of a plate over here. And while uh, Barb pointed out, apparently the statistics suggest that we don't throw out as much meat, maybe half as much, the reality is the footprint behind that meat is 10 times the footprint as the vegetable matter you're throwing out. So in reality, if you're throwing out 20% of the meat, you're actually throwing out a heck of a lot of food because it took so much grain to make that meat. So quite simply, you're absolutely right that, that a, a one hectare per animal or one acre per animal, that's kind of a stocking rate that you might have in, further in the West. But um, you aren't going to have the meat production that we have come to demand at a very, as was suggested in the movie, at a low cost. And it is this education you're talking about, it is this setting where we could possibly start to demand higher quality meat, just like the movie talked about. Less of it, uh, you know, Michael Pollan's eat food, not too much, mostly plants, is a pretty good, Rule of thumb, yeah. I think um, I read a similar article by Foley who mm -hmm. wrote it in, in 2010 or 11, five points. The fourth one that you didn't mention, the, uh, the one of raising the yield yeah. ceiling was important, but in their, in their opinion, uh, the fourth one was uh, um, that there's such a disparity between between uh, the developed world mm. and the developing world as far as, uh, as yield. And, and when we try to um, transfer our, uh, our know-how yep. to Africa, right. whatever, it hasn't fit very well. Right. As, as, as David said about, about, they just don't have the access to all those inputs. Right. But, um, but in there, they said that in, when, when the population reaches nine, not, not nine billion, 2050, uh, that that doubling the food supply of the planet will rely on that on that on that fourth yeah. uh, concept of, of 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 figuring out a way to get uh, these extremely low yielding right. uh, uh, lands that are not low yielding mm -hmm. because of their inferior fertility or marginal right. land, but because they just we haven't really optimized uh, the practice, and so and so I don't know what will succeed, but, well, yeah, but, so that's, this is but that's, that's key, I think. Absolutely, it's closing the yield gap. Yes. Um, so this is what could be produced theoretically on those lands. And the assumptions that go into that, what could be produced are rich because they, they either presuppose 
a lot of nitrogen fertilizer or not very much nitrogen fertilizer and things like irrigation or not irrigation and what, uh, and what drip ir ir irrigation versus precisely this, yeah this, air, this, air, this aerial spray but I guess I mean from our perspective at the land institute where we um, we we really feel like the the, the type of progress that can be made in what we're calling ecological intensification is we have much more to offer than what's under the hood of some of the folks in working in more industrial agricultural systems where the ecology is pretty compromised. Um, in fact, the, the, uh, another comment I had about the second film uh, at the fork was you know, I mean, it was one, one topic, and they, it was brilliant to talk about uh, animals, but it was as though there wasn't a similar magnitude, magnitude of a crisis in the plant-based foods part of the world. You know, the, the solution was to eat more plants, and, to, to, and that would take a lot of pressure off this uh, need to treat animals this way and, and, and raise them in these industrial settings. But the fact that our agriculture growing most of our grains, most of our agricultural lands are treated as horrifically, ecologically speaking, as those chickens were being treated in that confinement egg production system. And what that looks like is a plowed, denuded landscape as far as the eye can see that we have grown accustomed to seeing year after year and accepting it just as a natural part of where we live. When in reality, that ecosystem is profoundly compromised. And when folks like Foley write articles on how we're going to need ecological intensification to feed the world by 2050, we're going, where are you going to find that ecological intensification? Where, how are you going to get these processes of stopping nitrogen from leaking out of the bottom of the system or building soil organic matter or having soil microbes that do all sorts of neat things to maintain productivity? How are you going to get it to do that with the current systems that we have? And uh, so just as a, a side note in terms of what's going on right here in Salina, um, there is a lot of excitement about a natural systems agriculture being able to bring us closer to a more functional ecosystem that has promise in the long run compared to the input intensive approach that even the, the film was kind of acknowledging is, is, is better. And, and maybe it is better than the animal side, but all is not well in the plant world um, too. Yeah. Um, I really appreciated the opportunity that the Art Center gave in presenting these two films and for the discussion, I think. Um, I've been involved in one way or another in you know, gardening or agriculture, uh, environmental protection kinds of things for uh, quite a long time. And um, there's some things that kind of struck me about, especially the second film uh, today. Um, there was a contrast between the, the guys who were justifying their industrial agriculture and that mindset yes. and um, those who were um, more emotional about their animals. And you expect that in young people, but uh, then there was the beef farmer who was saying that as he grew older, and, and he wasn't an old guy, um, but as he grew more mature, I guess, um, the idea of uh, treatment of his animals became more and more important to him as organisms. And like you're talking about cropland, people don't think about that soil as being an organism. And sometimes when I've gone out in the fields as part of my work, and I would see there's not a weed, there's not a grasshopper. I dig a hole, there's no worms, there's nothing in there. It's dead. And so that's, that's, that was really troublesome to me to see that. Um, but what I really, what made me respect the one fellow who decided to change the way he was doing things. Um, 
and uh, there's, to me, I see that there's a web of things that we can do, that we can do to change things and, and uh, try to prevent the inevitable firearm gun actions. Um, for instance, um, providing uh, contraception. Um, you know, go. You know, we're not talking about zero population growth anymore, like we did 40 years ago, uh, and how important that is. Or, um, you know, you think soil and green. We're eating people now. Uh, you know, that's one way to get rid of the overpopulation. Another way is to send them to war, or to not provide health care and let them die. You know, or um, poison them and they'll get cancer. And oh well, you know, well we don't have money to treat that either. So. Um, it made me examine my own attitudes and thinking, well, I need to be more serious about how I you know, behave in the world. Um, maybe I should be willing to pay twice as much for that meat that's sustainably grown than I have been. Um, but I, you know, if one thing that kind of dissuaded some farmers from growing things more sustainably was uh, USDA. Uh, the farm bill rules. Um, so there was disincentives to diversify, for instance. And um, so we have a, a momentum of doing things the same way, and that's not really good for us. You t I talk to soybean farmers and say, well, could you grow edamame? Or could you grow um, food grade Milo? Or, you know, different things like this. And it's like, a realm that they never consider. I'd like to see more of that. Well, Great I, for the I, Land Institute, too. I can mm -hmm. share with both Bill and uh, Tim Sarah about the, uh, the Ford film. What I really appreciated about that film was that it was very emotionally deep. You had yes. got people's reasons for it. And you're talking about the farmer change one example, but on any variety of levels, wide intellectual breadth breadth and coverage, but really deep emotional tie. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, and I was going to ask that question about Mr. Foley and that, and, and this thing, is there a mechanism? Where is there a mechanism? I think Tim, you're asking the same question. How do you make that happen on the ground? Uh, there's so much to be said, but what we need is a really benevolent dictator, <laughs> different than the one we have now. Benevolence <laughs> being the primary criteria. But uh, for example, you can go into, you can organize teams and you can go into different blocks and salon and say, ma'am, at two o'clock, we're going to be here and serve. Right after supper, we're going to be here. We're going to strap you in your chair. We're going to show you this film at four. And then you can join with us. We'll free you up after that. Then you have to sit in the chair. We'll be here while they're done and make sure you don't move. <laughs> yeah. but, 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 it, but to be serious about it, how do you get a consciousness of the seriousness of the situation in a population who's mostly concerned, and like me, where the next bit of protein is coming from. Yeah, they're worried about the next football game. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, we've got so many distractions. You know, another good video on the waste situation that I recommend is called Dive. And it's dumpster divers in LA. Yeah. And, and you talked about we don't throw away much meat. This this young couple who had, who had two young children I don't know if they, ha I can't remember if they had jobs or not, but they dumpster dive fairly professionally. And they decided to get a freezer, a fairly small chest type freezer. Within a week, they filled that with a year's worth of food for their family <laughs> so, from dumpster mm -hmm. diving. Yeah, yeah, they had yeah. a whole community of divers. And, and they, got with, they, they went to corporations and said, can we do this? No. So they went to the, local store manager and said, can we do this? And they said, yes, because they gave a lot of it to, you know, food bank and, and you know, homeless and things like that. They also made their own barbecue. Uh, a whole dozen of eggs, you know, unbroken. Uh, yeah, that's remarkable. Oh, I, I, having taught at a, a kind of a progressive college in Arizona, uh, we, we did a trip every summer kind of like the movie, visiting all of these different farming operations uh, from California to the Land Institute. And they, they, 
about in 1999 or so, the dumpster diving uh, ethos set in at the college. And whenever we'd pull into a town, they'd be in the dumpster and I'd be like, oh my gosh, you know. And it wasn't always okay. I wasn't always legal. I wasn't sure, but um, it is amazing what they would pull out. I mean, they lived off dumpster diving, these students did for, you know, years, actually. And, and, they, and they get the store's formula. Yeah, you know, when, when the stuff. They throw this stuff out. Yep. And so they're, you know, they're a, a plan ahead organization. <laughs> but then you let that secret out, everybody's going to know about it. The dumpsters will be quickly. Yeah. I was just going to say, I think, um, just going back to the whole meat thing, I think there's like an attitude problem where people, I'm a vegetarian and I cook vegetarian meals and my husband eats and I'm always like, well, so do you cook separate dinners for your husband? I'm like, no, like he eats what I eat. And they're like, well, it's not a meal without the meat. And it's like, I think people really treat meat like as a necessity. Right. Like you're not going to, like most people aren't going to die if they don't eat meat. Um, and they don't treat it like another food group. They treat it like... Right. So, you know, like they don't treat it how they treat vegetables or fruit right. or grains. Right. It's like we don't need meat as much as we act like we need meat. Mm -hmm. And I think, like, unless you can get that out, like, it's not manly to not eat a lot of meat. Like, it's, I don't know, it's like a very cultural thing we have where we just need to consume meat, like, at this really extreme level. And I, I don't know how things are going to change if people don't, um, like, have an attitude change. Mm -hmm. We don't, I mean, I've been living without meat for nearly 10 years, sure. and I'm still here. Like, it's not, like, yeah, yeah. Lying, but, That's... but I don't, I just don't know how you get that through to people. Like, I, you know, people have health crises. I've seen that shift people fairly dramatically. Uh, but, you know, I think a, watching a movie like this could have an effect with some people. Um, it's, it's tough, though. It's very hard. I, I guess, I think it was, here's one of the parallels between the two movies is, uh, I, was, I was likening the, uh, the facilitation of someone dying in Soylent Green with the, with the flowers and the music and all of that um, as kind of the high-end humane treatment of animals, a very, very personal touch, as opposed to the scooping out in the, uh, on the, in just throwing them in the back. That's more the industrial model, right, of, of death in soil and green, if, if I dare draw this. And I, I started to think, I don't really believe the trophic, uh, that, 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 that soil and green, that enough people were dying to be able to feed people that much soil and green, okay, for one thing. Just, I hate to pick on this, but there is, there is like a one to 10 ratio probably of how much soil and green you can get out of the number of people. And, it's, and while it was just one day a week, I still think it was probably, and, and the, the cost of producing soil and green with the high end human care, okay? One body at a time going through that whole thing? I don't think so. I mean, it, the scoop is what's gonna feed the masses at the cost that because it costs nothing, right? Pretty much it was being produced for the, the masses. But on a more serious note, um, <laughs> I did, it, it, the ratio, if you will, or the, or the, the degree to which food pro meat production was humane was correlated with people, with humane, with humanity being with those animals, right? I mean, the more it took people raising and scratching and nurturing and, give, and helping with birthing and watering and putting them out to pasture, it actually took a high level of integration of people to produce humane meat, not surprisingly, right? And so the degree to which we trade off the next thing was where we actually still use people, but in an industrialized assembly mode where you might hire uh, illegal or legal immigrants into a into a, you know a, a feedlot in Garden City, Kansas, and every human there is replaceable with another human because their jobs are defined and they're intended to be replaceable. But but it's something that fossil fuels still can't do. So we use humans in an industrial system to get the work done. But the ultimate goal, of course, is using fossil fuels directly to get all the work done, which is what was going on with that chicken egg operation. I mean, it was remarkable how few people were working in that system, 
highly automated. You just stick this animal in the cage and then that eggs come out and the water, the manure, and, and, and this is where the cheap food, the inhumane food, if you will, comes from. But the cost of trying to produce, you know, when the guy said uh, nine bucks a dozen for his eggs, and that's still with a fair amount of fossil fuel subsidy, I would suspect, because it's happening everywhere we, we, everything we do is subsidized by fossil fuels to some extent in agriculture. Um, it does raise the challenge of, of how we can back out of this high carbon cul-de-sac we're in with climate change and a dependence on fossil fuels if we really are going to be able to pull off a, a uh, low carbon existence in agriculture. It's, it's, it's very, it's, it's more challenging than we think. Uh, we are so, so deeply embedded. The, just the distribution of food and the distribution of inputs is, is in and of itself huge. But even on the farm, on an organic farm, we use fossil fuels to address almost every ecological, ecological limiting factor. It may not seem like it, but, it, but if one way or another, it's integrated into the production system. And I'd love to talk to people more about that uh, if you're interested. But it's, it's a huge challenge. It's a huge challenge. But I have a couple things. One, one was, again, I hope that the, 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 uh, uh, the, the second film was, was wonderful to show the diversity that yeah. was trying not to be just one-sided. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea how the more ethical treatment and the more uh, um, uh, um, less industrialized treatment is going, is how that kind of thinking is going to evolve. That is, it's really going to, you know, you know, I'm sure that organic farm, farming is a bigger percentage of the total food production in the United States than it was a decade ago or, or 20 well, years ago. Yeah, maybe 2%. But, but, the, uh, but in that film, there was, what surprised me was you had these very low technology approaches, and then there was one version of that egg lake where they were showing that, yes, you have the cages uh, um, and the crowding and whatnot, and then they had this other version, which was very technological, very low, um, uh, lay, lay, labor input, mm -hmm. but it was it was it was it, it was taking the, the lives of those hens into into account, and I, I thought that that was an example of you know of something that uh, looked looked more positive, a combination of technology and and concern for for the humane tree, tree, tree treatment of the livestock, right, right. and the only other uh, um, on this whole idea of of inputs, the only thing that I thought was interesting was a program I saw recently about Norway, about how 100% of the electricity is either re renewable or, or, or um, uh, they have all kinds of hydroelectric uh, of reserves because of the, because of the nature of, 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 of where they are. Um, and, and so it just struck me that why can't a country that, that doesn't rewalk, and, and yet they're a big producer of oil and gas at the same time, but they're exporting it, they're not, they're not, they're not using it for their own economy. And what struck me when I was watching is I said, well, why can't they use all that electricity to, uh, if, if one of the limiting factors in agriculture is, is nitrogen fixation, why can't renewable energy be used to fix nitrogen and overcome that? That limit, not all limits, sure. but, uh, but that was, and, and whether with this big push, you know, now all this, the photovoltaics get so expensive, will that be a new source of energy to replace the fossil fuels, right. I guess? Well, That's my I think we're, we're nearing the end here, maybe, of the discussion. I'm sensing, I know the lights just went on and off, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but I, 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 uh, well, I'm on that thread box. <laughs> generally speaking, the, the infrastructure of Norway was still built on fossil fuels, and it might be running kind of its current account off a lot of renewables with a lot of financial input from the sale of fossil fuels, as you point out. Uh, um, but 
Most folks that look at the gap between renewables and our fossil fuel economy are still in the ballpark of we need to reduce by 75 to 90 percent of the total energy we need to really actually s synchronize. Um, and that is very depressing to some and, and optimistic to others, but it's still a huge, a huge leap from where we are. Uh, the, the number, I, I did need to convey the number that I told all students always, if you go away from this discussion with any one statistic, it's that a, one gallon of gas has 100 hours of human labor embodied in it. One gallon of gas is 100, and if you don't believe that, try to move a 4,000 pound vehicle 20 miles by yourself without turning it on. Okay, just you. It will take you 100 hours at least, and, and, and you know, there's many other examples of that, but the, that shows why we have gone with hiring that $2.30 for those 100 hours versus if you're paying 10 bucks an hour, that's $1,000. I mean, it really is that order of magnitude in terms of energy disparity, and that explains why growing corn in Iowa Farmers, you know, I, I, we stopped on the side of the road. I finally got the, the picture of uh, the Kansas farmer feeding 155 people, including you. Um, and I'm, I, I said, well, yes, that Kansas farmer and about 400 fossil fuel slaves that are working for that Kansas farmer because 99.96% of the energy used to grow the grain comes from fossil fuels. Back when this country was founded, it was 0% came from fossil fuels. And now it's almost 100%. The, the farmer is simply out working the fossil fuels in the tractor, in the nitrogen fertilizer, in the herbicides, in the harvester, in all of the ways. And that's where we've come. So it's, again, I, I, I get excited about this topic, but it is, but we're in it quite deep. And, and even the, the feed race to, to feed some of these more humanely produced animals is, is very much embedded. Organic agriculture is very much embedded in it. Because organic agriculture dumpster dives for nutrients, uses what happens with the, with the feedlot manure outside of uh, Garden City, Kansas. It's spread on land in western Kansas, near Scott City. There are organic Mennonite farmers growing wheat that goes to Heartland Mills, and it is feedlot manure that is providing the nutrients to raise that organic wheat. Where did the nitrogen come from? It came from the grain that was grown to feed the livestock. You see what I'm saying? So in this way, organic agriculture is as dependent on nitrogen fertilizer as, as conventional in this instance. It's not always the case, but anyway. Can I just, yeah. were you going to say something, sir? I was going to say a little bit about um, globally how when, uh, when countries become more, uh, get richer, mm -hmm. they start oh. eating more meat, yeah. and that that Iowa farmer was sending all that pork to yes. Japan, yeah. for instance. But, you know, here we're, want, we're talking about cutting back our meat consumption by 40% or something, and... We're down to 40%. We're down to 40%. Yeah. And um, I also thought, you know, something that April said about making these choices, that even the, the, the guy that made the movie, was not convinced. I mean, he could just as easily look at this stuff and put it out of his mind and, um, you know, order an extra side of bacon at breakfast. What is that, like, I don't get where that comes from because, like, I have dogs at home and I love those dogs. I mean, I like animals, so I don't want to pay to have them tortured for my personal benefit. Like, I just wonder where that disconnect comes from. Like. Like, why do people not care that animals are being tortured? Because they don't have why? cows and pigs in their homes. I mean, the, but they still the systematic, have I mean, the way that empathy was thwarted in all those operations, uh, and it's, I mean, it's that relation. They, they, they're not looking them in the eye every day the way you are yeah. looking 
Yeah. Right, yeah. but you don't have to have a pet cow to know that they feel things and they have feelings and they feel pain and they feel torture. Like everyone knows that. Like it's not. No, they don't. Yeah, they don't. Unfortunately, but like why? So people do people really think that dogs feel things but cows don't? Like. Yeah, they don't think about it. They don't think about it. They don't. That's but just you're like living with them in a way that promotes the sympathy with the animal that you're not with what you eat. I guess I feel like people should just know, I know. that like a cow can be happy or a cow can be depressed. Like, uh, why, why don't we eat dogs and horses? Why, why is it, right. you know, we, we're all pissed off Chinese because right. they, they eat dogs. Right, there's no difference. I, I mean, I don't know. Well, <laughs> And, you know, it's it's just an emotional approach to things, and we divorced emotions from people. You know, my my wife was in 4-H, and she raised a cow to be killed. You know, she loved the thing. She she loves cows today. She loves the smell of them. But I don't know how you love that, something like that. Why I attracted her? I'm <laughs> <laughs> Well, it seems to me that I think we were really touching on what, what I thought was a, a connection between the two films is human empathy and animal human empathy. I mean, fellow sentient being empathy. Because when the thing that runs through my head in Soiling Green is Heston climbing up over those steps full of people laying there and stepping on some of them and, and, and how that gets divorced in this mass civilization. civilization. And then, as I said, the really great depth of emotional understanding and how humans came to understand more about their animals being raised, it, it, we need to have them watch that film. Yeah. Um, so I, I think a solution to how we do this, other than the benevolent dictator uh, solution, is to have people connecting with one another and beginning to understand where they are. We talked at the Unitarian Fellowship today about race and class. How do we, we, we can't bridge those very easily in Salina, Kansas. But uh, if we can have people talking to each other at a feeling level, which is no easy task, then we may begin to get the kind of conversation we need to facilitate their food production, reasonable food production, so. I think too, as a nation, we grew up and we are always looking for the bargains, that we just have that mindset of buying things the cheapest um, that's out there and it, it's hard to change that, but we definitely need a paradigm shift. And, and that's one reason why we waste so much food is among, I think it's most of the nations in the world, we spend the least amount of money on our food. Right, right. We just need some paradigms to rub together. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> 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 we look at that last, uh, I guess it was the California operation, where you really saw how hard it was emotionally. And Thinking, those people should be paid a lot of money for that. Mm -hmm. The way an emergency room doctor was poor. You know, that was mm -hmm. hard work. And things were, people were paid what their services were worth. That would yeah. adjust the market a little bit. Well, we have a surprising new solution to this whole problem, actually. So, yeah, yeah, it, 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 and it's. This is a good segue to this next topic. <laughs> uh, I, I have tentatively diagnosed myself with this tick allergy that you're, you might have read about it, where you're allergic to red meat. You're allergic to mammals. It's, it's the alpha-gal tick-borne allergy. Is that, who's heard of this? OK, yeah, so it's, it's been in the news quite a bit lately actually my my sister's in minnesota and she was sending me multiple it's been in the news at npr and everything there um i discovered it because i had a severe reaction to eating a steak uh head to toe hives respiration i mean i it, there's no question that that allergy exists and i've had it now multiple times so i'm not eating it, it's it's by mammals so pork uh venison beef bison Chicken and fish are not in the category as these mammals, but we have been joking about how this this is a surprising thing that's happening. Uh, it is spreading substantially, and there's thousands of people who are becoming allergic. 
I'm like, John Foley's gonna love this. We just need to breed these ticks, drop them on major urban areas, and you know, there's no choice. They're, I mean, it becomes pretty uh, obvious. That's right. Is that evolution? Like, I mean, is that like you know, like they know that we need to? Eat I, I I wouldn't go so that far. I mean, the the, the, the idea that somehow ticks are trying to control our meat consumption. Right. <laughs> it's hard to see where the selection is happening there, yeah. but but it is uh, it is intriguing to the, to realize that this allergy is seems to be taking off and it is quite quite intriguing. So. Uh, Stay tuned. My, my doctor, by the way, does not believe I have it. I have an official diagnosis the end of July, but I'm, I'm actually, I'm 99% sure it's, it's real. But we have the technology. We don't need a carpet bomb on these ticks. We can just put drones. That's right. Place, place them, you know. In the mall, in the court. You know, here they come. Good point, Cardi. But the, the point that Sarah brought up is, is haunting in that, um, I, you know, I, I Humans have never had access to the kind of meat that we have in this society. And therefore, um, it seems almost insatiable that, that we've gone from eating, whenever you, what she was describing is, there's many, many studies that show as societies attain greater discretionary income, they buy more meat. They just do. It's happening in China in a huge way right now. It's sucking the grain markets out of the, the entire world and India is, India has certain religious uh, hurdles, but apparently India also is starting to pick up on its meat consumption as discretionary income increases there as well. Um, and, and, it, and yet it doesn't seem to plateau. And I, I call this kind of thing, using an Ehrlich, Paul Ehrlich term, an evolutionary hangover in that you would never have this problem and it was always beneficial to eat more meat um, but that because for all of our evolutionary existence until the latest 50 years, this was just not a possibility. And so uh, it's very intriguing that the statistic that was mentioned about Foley saying we need to double food production by 2050 when there's only two more billion people being added. So why, why, what's up with the math there? But what's in the, underneath those numbers is anticipating this phenomenon I'm talking about. Greater discretionary income as the economies grow yeah. and greater demand for animal products requiring more food production. That's what's under the hood. And there's a bunch of us who have been very adamant to not agree to that statement that we need to double food production by 2050. That's like giving in. We need to actually figure out how we can avoid having to double food production People are not eating the meat yet, but we need to lead by example before we start suggesting, as we were doing with fossil fuels, that other people curb their fossil fuel addiction or other people could curb their meat consumption before we do. I've heard many times about, about this increasing consumption of meat, but also I think the increase in, 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 uh, in food security is more about, is equally, um, uh, about um, about mal malnutrition that that it's not uh, I mean you know I probably eat fifty percent more cal cal calories that I that I need to sustain myself but I think that is that 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 billion people in the world that are malnourished yeah they're not looking to eat meat they're looking to I to, agree to eat instead of instead of you know a hundred grams of rice to be able to get a, a, you know a, you know a, 200 or 300 grams of, 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 uh, of rice a day. And so I think that, that you know, it, it, But it's not a it, doubling, it, it, it's it, not it, a doubling. It, this is the thing, it's, you're, you're absolutely right. And some of that increase is addressing malnutrition. Yes. A huge percentage of it is, is, is this meat anticipation, is, is a more animal product based diet in a more increasing wealthy world. Because to, to deal with a billion malnourished people, and I mean, we could do it with almost raising no more food by distribution alone. Uh, I mean, I'm sure we could, but it's... There's another film, Tim, that, that deals with, with vegetarianism just from a health perspective, no 
no emotional, yep. say the animals or any of that stuff. It's done by two doctors. They did separate studies unknowingly. One was in China, in China and I can't remember what other toxins the other one was on. I saw forks over knives. Yeah, we saw that at the UU. Yeah. Yeah. Is it called again? Forks over knives. Oh, yeah. 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 Quite interesting, yeah. and, and I've seen interviews with those two doctors, medical doctors, by the way, <clears throat> both vegetarians, and, and tell why. And uh, yeah. uh, I don't eat much meat, but boy, it's just really hard. I'm like the guy in the movie; it's really hard to think about <laughs> giving it up totally. Uh, and I know people always say, like, well, meat tastes so good. But, like, I'm sure heroin feels really good. But, like, <laughs> we don't do it. You know, like, there are a lot of things that taste good or feel good, but we don't do them because we shouldn't. Right. They're bad for us. But people don't think about me like that. I like likening meat consumption to heroin. But. <laughs> I'm interested in the ethical treatment for growing grains that you can brew with. We need to show real <laughs> compassion for that. Well, so are there any other concluding thoughts or questions or uh, testimonials that are not yet there? Yeah. <laughs> Beans. Beans. They're what's for dinner. <laughs> All right. Is that when I was preparing for this, I saw that there was a new movie that was called uh, Food Evolution. Uh, uh, came out, I guess, in 2016, and they have a website uh, called Food Evolution movie.com and it's all about G G GMOs mm -hmm. and, um, and what the benefits and what the negative and it's just a matter of having an organization that wants to screen it to mm -hmm. uh, to go to that is could there be a continuing discussion I yeah guess. that would be great that would be a great uh, I, I'd be up for that yes yeah hear that Anything else? thank you all right thank you